Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Doug R. from Tahunga, California. Hi, everybody. My name is Doug Rowell, and I am a grateful alcoholic. I'm grateful to be an alcoholic and grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, if that sounds strange to you, that's because you're new. <laughs> you know, uh, people who have been around sober for a while understand it's a, it's a good thing to be an alcoholic. When you first find out you are one, it's not that exciting. Uh, I, uh, I want to thank Kim for calling me and inviting me to come out here. And, and uh, I love this group. And, and uh, thank Bob for picking me up at the airport and taking care of me all day. And um, thank the group for for including me in your, in your uh, unusual expenses. I, uh, <laughs> <coughs> I should tell you that since uh, my very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on uh, September 26, 1986, it hasn't been necessary for me to take a drink of alcohol or any mind-altering chemical. But uh, necessary or not, I, I drank on the way home from that meeting. So I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't understand that it wasn't necessary. I, I, there's a lot of things happening there, and I didn't get the not necessary part. So I actually, um, and I needed a drink. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I actually do have a sobriety date. Sometimes I forget to tell people. Um, it's, uh, my actual sobriety date is June 7th of 1987. Um, so I was around AA for a while before I, before I decided uh, I was going to stick around and stop drinking. I went to my first meeting to just to sort of see what was going on here. I had a couple of friends who had gotten sober, and uh, um, their lives seemed to be better. I sort of missed them as drinking buddies, but, um, but it looked like they were, they were into a good thing. It was good for, I was glad they got sober, actually, because they were not good drunks. And they were fun, but, uh, but their lives were falling apart, you know, not like mine. And uh, so I had mine almost together. <laughs> it was any, any day now, I'm going to get it back together. And, and uh, um, so I went to see, somebody had told me, if you, if you want to go to a meeting, if you want to go check out a meeting, go to this big speaker meeting at uh, Valley Presbyterian Hospital in Van Nuys. It's a big meeting, it's a big uh, speaker meeting, and they'll leave you alone. And it's a meeting about like this, a couple hundred people, and, and uh, they lied to me. Uh, people don't leave you alone at AA meetings, you know, <laughs> if you're... If you're new here and you, and you just showed up here, chances are somebody has already come up to you and said, hey, are you new? Welcome to the, you know, it's like, because I, I didn't want any, I didn't really want to talk to anybody. I wanted to observe. And I told people too, I, I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to join up. I didn't even sit down. It was a meeting like this with doors at the back. And I stood on one side of the door with my arms crossed, like in my leave me alone pose. And, uh, um, but they, they didn't, you know, some people did, but people come up, hi, are you new? And I haven't seen you here before. How long are you sober? You know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, not, I'm, I'm not a, a, a member. I'm a, a, like auditing the class, you know. I'm just checking it out, all right? You know, I'm a sort of just go on with your little meeting. I'll stay back here. Well, we hope you find here what we found here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever. You know, I, uh, there's some chairs over there if you want to sit. I get it. I get it. I see people come in, put down a purse, put down a jacket, put down keys. No purse, no jacket, no keys. That seat's available. I'm a figure outer. I got that. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay, and so I'm just, I'm just checking it out. You know, uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I may have to leave, you know, and I don't want to get up and cause a scene. Excuse me, excuse me, and, you know, interrupt your whole, so I'm going to stay back here by the door. All right, you know. And I, I wish, now I don't wish I had gotten sober 20 years later, but I do wish that they had had Bluetooth, you know, when, because uh, there's nothing really that I know of that says I'm very important, I may get a call any minute and have to leave, then a piece of flashing electronic jewelry, you know, just. <laughs> and uh, I, they, didn't, they didn't even have cell phones when I got sober. I mean, m they had mobile phones, but they were big. They were in briefcases. Only rich people had them. Um, <laughs> But uh, most people didn't have, but well, people had pagers. I didn't have a pager. Nobody wanted to contact me. It'd be pointless for me to have a pager, you know. But, but uh, I had, what I did have, I had, a, I had a garage door opener that I got at Goodwill, and it had like a belt loop uh, thing on it, you know, and, 
and I would carry that on my, on my belt. And so I'd look like somebody might want to contact me. And if I got tired of talking to you or my drink alarm went off or whatever, you know, I'd just go, I got to get this, uh, you know, <laughs> see ya. And then some, some wise ass would say, what is that? It looks like my garage door opener. <laughs> Yeah, it's a combination garage door, pager, TV remote. It's like the coolest thing. Uh, anyway, uh, so I'm back there at the door, and there was another cool guy on the other side of the door doing the same thing I was doing. They both had our arms crossed and leaning against the wall. I go, okay, this, is, this guy is cool. We're, the, we're like the cool section of this group. And uh, so we were so cool, we didn't even talk to each other. We were like, you know. <laughs> People, uh, people were nice. I remember people were nice at the meeting. They, uh, everybody was, you know, saying, keep coming back. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> and uh, people in my life were not saying, keep coming back. You know, people who knew me and loved me were saying, don't come over here. <laughs> Stay away, you know. Hey, it's Doug. Are you, are, are you going to be home for a while? Is I'm going to come over and visit you guys. No. No, we're not, Doug. We're, we're just walking out the door. I mean, I, I don't know... Uh, when we'll be back? Long time though. Don't don't come over here. Um, okay, love you, mom. And uh, I got uninvited to a wedding in uh, 1985. Um, some <laughs> they don't get me wrong. They invited me. They sent me an invitation, and I RSVP'd. And and I I think they got the the thing and said. Doug's coming, <laughs> you know, and I got, the wedding is Saturday morning, I get this call Thursday night, hey, uh, hi Doug, it's, uh, it's Bob, um, hey, how you doing Bob, how, how's Carol, um, oh, she's good, hey, you guys nervous, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, actually, that, that's, that's what I called about, um, Carol and I were, were talking, and, and we, uh, we like for you to not come to the wedding, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's cool, isn't it? You know, <laughs> we'd like you to not come to our wedding we already invited you to. I already bought him a present. It's wrapped and sitting on my dining room table, and they're calling to tell me not to come. But I, I wasn't offended. I wasn't even curious. I got it. I totally got it. I, I thought, good idea, you know. Because uh, uh, we had all been at a wedding the weekend before, and I... Um, uh, <laughs> I mooned the bride's mother, and... Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't go there to moon the bride's mother. It just, you know, everybody was having a good time. We were celebrating their, their matrimony, and I just I was so, just feeling good with an open bar. Good idea. And uh, let's invite Doug and give him all the free booze he wants. And, and so everybody's dancing, and I'm up by the bandstand, and just when it, just as the song is ending, I thought, you know what would be funniest to show my ass? <laughs> it just seemed like the funniest thing that could happen. And so as soon as it, ba -da 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 -da, and they stopped, and I, hey! <laughs> and you could, you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> I, I wish you guys had been there, because you clearly see the humor in it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but nobody laughed. And I mean, these people are friends of mine. Some, they, some of them have a good sense of humor, but they just didn't get it. And, uh, I knew I was wrong. I knew I was wrong. I was like, the only thing you can do then is to sort of get dressed. Woo, all right then, you know, and a couple of friends of mine grabbed me and drug me out in the alley. God damn, man, what's wrong with you? Jesus Christ, Doug, you, you mooned the bride's mother. Excuse me, you know, I thought it was the groom's mother. <laughs> I, hey, I'm sorry, I, you know, it was at the reception. I didn't do it in the ceremony for Christ's sake. What am I, an uh, animal, you know? And he gave up. You could see him go, I give up. Somebody nicknamed me Doug Scusting, and that, that stuck for years. And uh, So when I came to AA, and people were being nice to me, I thought, okay, this, is, this ain't bad. And, uh, and they, had, uh, they started the meeting, and they had a birthday that night, and I didn't know what the birthday was. Uh, uh, birthday, and they said, we have a birthday for Ruth for 18 years. And uh, like Ephraim did, took an 18-year cake tonight. They had a birthday. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I got a little bronchitis. I'm not, I'm not apologizing for being sick, but I may cough up here. And, um, 
anyway, uh, they, they, I was looking around, they said they had an 18-year birthday for Ruth, and I'm looking around for Ruth, some, you know, 18-year-old tiny honey. <laughs> it's like, <clears throat> where's Ruth? And uh, I'm looking for, and all of a sudden, Ruth gets up. I know it's Ruth, because she's coming up to the podium in uh, the front of the room, and she's, and <laughs> it's 50 if she's a day. I'm, I'm, and I thought, God damn, if she's 18, she should stop drinking. And, and, uh, <laughs> But, but I had to throw that one away because she, she obviously wasn't 18, but she, but she looked good. I mean, she didn't look bad. She, she looked whipped for a teenager, but, uh, you know, but she was dressed and coiffed and everything. And uh, three younger girls came out with a cake and candles blazing, and everybody started singing just like you guys did. Actually, very much like you guys did. Uh, in uh, four different keys at the same time, and... Uh, <laughs> Some of the people were not even committed to the key they started in, and, uh, and I, was, I, I have a musical background. I was a little put off by this. I, I thought, all these people here, somebody must be able to, they had a piano on stage. They had a stage thing and a piano on it with a sheet over it. And I thought, somebody here has got to be able to play piano well enough to play Happy Birthday. I could do it, you know. I, um, maybe I should run up and yank that sheet off of there. Hold it, people. Here I come to save the day. You know what? Uh, <laughs> but I already told them I wasn't staying, so uh, I, got, I got no lines. I told everybody I wasn't staying, so, you know, I'm going to run up there and save their... It's a short song. I can handle it. And, uh, and so then uh, Ruth gets up the podium and says, Hi, everybody. My name's Ruth, and I'm an alcoholic. And everybody's like, Hi, Ruth! <laughs> oh, God. Oh, this is some level of lameness I never imagined existed. <laughs> and uh, she said, I want you to know that over these last 18 years of sobriety, I've attended a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every single day. 18 years every single day. And people were, people were going, wow. And, oh, yes, yeah, she does. She never misses. And I'm in the back. Like, everybody seemed to be impressed with it. But me, I'm in the back going, you, you little slow, ain't you, Ruth? You know, you're, you are not the sharpest pencil in the box, honey. Because uh, I don't know how long it'll take me to get this deal if I want it, but I know it's not going to take every day for 18 years. Um, I'm a quick study. I'm a hum a few bars and I'll fake it kind of guy. And uh, so, uh, oh, and then the, then the other cool guy starts coming over to me, and I'm like, what is he? And then I realize he's not cool. He's a member. I don't know why he's back there. I mean, Maybe he's got the newcomer catcher commitment or something, but, uh, but he comes over and he's got his hand out and he says, hey, I'll tell you what, you stay sober a year, we'll give you one of them cakes. <laughs> I mean, that was hard to process. Don't drink for a year and I get a cake? <laughs> I knew he meant well, you know, but... Uh, I said, uh, you know, I don't want to hurt his feelings. I said, you know, I'm, I'm not much of a pastry eater. Um, <laughs> if I want a cake, I just, you know, stop at Safeway on the way home. I think they're like five bucks or something. Or, or I could not drink for a year. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, let me think about it. <clears throat> no, nah, cake's not even out of my way. I'm going to stop and get a six pack anyway on the way home. But, um, <laughs> but um, thanks. And, uh, and then I remember that somebody talked for a long time, and they read a bunch of stuff, and, and, uh, and, and somebody, um, it was secretary of the meeting, she, she held up this book, and she said, this is our big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, she said, it's the basic text of the program. It's the only authority on AA. So I thought, meh. She said, if you're new tonight, if you're new here with us, don't leave without this book. So I said, okay, I'm new. I'll steal the book. Um, they had a... They had a bunch of them on a table, and uh, like this, like a literature table back here. And I thought I could go pick up that book, act like I'm reading it, like I'm fascinated with it, and walk right out the door, and they'll let me go. And I still think that might have happened. But then she screwed it all up because she said, if you're new tonight and you're financially embarrassed, we understand that. We want you to have this book. We'll make very liberal credit arrangements, including nothing down and nothing a week until you get back on your feet. 
So now, if I steal the book, you're going to think I'm not on my feet. You're going to think I'm homeless, you know. So I, my pride won't let me steal the book now. I got to wait till the end of the meeting and go up to her and say, uh, "Can I uh, can I buy one of those books?" She said, "Sure, the the big book." Yeah, the big book. <laughs> I've seen bigger. Uh, <laughs> how much is that big book? I said, it's it's four sixty five. Do you have it? I said, four sixty five for a hardcover book. Yeah, I think I can handle that. <laughs> here's here's a five. Keep the change. She said, I, I, I'll get you change for you. No, no, use that to help a drunk lady. I'm on my feet. Okay, so. I got that book and I went home and I started to read this book. Not read, read it, but I got out a, a, a bottle of whiskey and I poured a couple of shots and starting to skim through it, you know, not, not study read it, but some of it I didn't have to read. Um, for one thing, I have the ability to, I didn't have to read doctor's opinion because I've had doctor's opinions. <laughs> they, uh, doctors say to me things like, boy, you ought to not drink so much, you know, okay, I know what the doctors have to say. Uh, and I have the ability to look at a, the title of a chapter, just about any book, and, and know everything that's in the chapter. <laughs> it's a gift that I have. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm looking through this book, chapter one, Bill's story. Who cares? Chapter two. <laughs> chapter two, there's a solution. I know what there's a solution is a sales pitch. I was raised on TV. I know. Young man, there's a solution to your problem. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will give you a life beyond your wildest drunken dreams. Yeah. Next, chapter three, more about alcoholism. Now, that, doesn't that sound fascinating? I'll have to <laughs> get around to reading more about alcoholism one of these days. Huh? Study up on that for sure. Chapter four, we agnostics. OK, that surprised me. Um, I didn't expect to find a, a chapter called We Agnostics in the big book. Uh, I had, when I went to my first meeting, I liked pretty much the stuff I saw. I liked the hugging and laughing, and, and I pretty much believed that people there drank like I did and had stopped drinking, don't drink anymore. There was a couple of things that I didn't like about the first meeting, uh, and I thought they were pretty much uh, engendered to, to AA in general. Uh, one was the not drinking for extended periods. That seemed excessive to me. And, uh, uh, and then there was a lot of God stuff. I mean, a lot of God stuff. Not just, oh, God, there was a lot of God stuff. So high, higher power this, and uh, humbly asked him with a capital H. And, and I, my higher power, and, and uh, power greater than yourself, and, and admitted to God, and to God, and to God, to God, to God, to God, God. And I just, damn, damn. I, I, for some reason, I always thought that AA was the secular way to get sober, the way smart people got sober without God, because I knew you could get sober with God. My grandmother was a Pentecostal minister. She had a Skid Row mission on Beacon Street in San Pedro, California, and Beacon Street in the 1950s was a, a pretty nasty place. It was pretty much all saloons and hawk shops and shooting galleries, and my grandmother's little white dove mission was right in the middle of it. And, Grandmother would pull these wharf rats and winos in and feed them soup and Jesus. So I knew you could get sober on soup and Jesus. It just didn't seem worth it to me. And uh, I thought that AA was uh, the way the smart people got sober without God, the secular way. And when I came here and heard all this God stuff, I, was, I can't tell you how disappointed I was. I was just, I was very irritated and, and disappointed. I, But now I'm, I'm looking at this book that the secretary had said was the only authority on AA, and it's got a whole chapter called We Agnostics. So I read chapter four all the way through. Poured a shot of whiskey, read it completely all the way through. Got done, and I'm going, okay, I'm, I'm spacing out. I missed the whole smart people stay sober without God part. So I poured another shot of whiskey, and I read chapter four again more carefully. <laughs> Doug. Focus, focus, focus. So I, another time, I did this six times. Six shots of whiskey, six readings of chapter four, more and more carefully, and I guess the whiskey slowed down my brain to where I could focus on the black part and found that uh, no matter how many times I read it, it's not gonna say how the smart people stay sober without God. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a trick title, that chapter. If you haven't read that, I might as well clue you in, let the cat out of the bag right now. The chapter should be called How 
we agnostics came to believe in a power greater than ourselves, which saved us, saved us from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. But it's just you know too long to fit on the page, so <laughs> to just put it in there. Let's call it we agnostics and see if it makes atheists read it. You know, and and so. Uh, but there's some interesting stuff in there. If you read it six times, <laughs> uh, you, you might notice, I did, uh, a sentence that says, uh, we found that God doesn't make too hard terms on those who seek him. Huh. That's pretty simple and clear, to the point, and significant. It's significant because, to me because I never heard it anyplace else. It seems right. If there's a power that created the universe, probably wouldn't have this kind of ego problem that would demand that you come to him in a certain way. And yet, the, re the reason I was openly hostile to every sect of every religion that I knew about was that it seemed to me that every sect of every religion had certain spiritual hoops you had to jump through before God would even pay attention to you. My, my, my grandmother's Pentecostal church you know, never said to me, you know, the... They said my name in less than a syllable. They said, Look, <laughs> we are very sure that God makes hard times on those who seek him. Boy, you know God will not even hear your prayers unless you are baptized. And I don't mean uh, sprinkled on the forehead uh, like some Methodist. Uh, I'm talking about total submission, son. That's why we got a tank of water for Christ up here. Come on up, son. We're going to soak you down, pull you up, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Praise Jesus. Amen. Somebody get the boy a towel. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm 14. I'm going. <laughs> They're going to drown me. <laughs> He's gonna, she told them I touched myself. They're going to send my ass to Jesus tonight. <laughs> And that's when you start thinking on your feet. You know, you know what? Um, I got brand new jeans on. They're shrink to fit. Um, if I, next week, I'll wear like a wetsuit or something because I'd love to get in that Jesus tank. But, um, uh, you know, uh, but I mean, if you go, okay, well, all right, the Pentecostals are a little over the top. I'm talking about every sect of every religion that I knew about. My girlfriend was a Catholic. She had to go to confession, communion, confirmation, a bunch of other cons so she could learn how many... Hail Marys and our fathers were required to cleanse her soul of the various kinds of sins. You think I'm kidding. Catholics in here, no, I'm not. Various kinds, they got them categorized over there. Venial, menial, cardinal, mortal, some of them you don't even have to do them. If you think about them, express way to hell, partner. And uh, <laughs> think about them, yep, sorry, that's the way it is. And it's like, a <clears throat> that she would do all that stuff. Her whole family would jump through all these hoops that they needed to jump through it. They were happy to do it. It made their life a joy, you know, and uh, they still couldn't talk to God. You know, they talked to God's mom. Hello, Mrs. God, it's Julie. No, don't wake him. Just tell him I love him. Okay, bye. I never understood that. My friend Michael was an Orthodox Jew, and uh, they were, I, I don't know, it was, a, it was a strange kind of culture in that house. It was a warm, loving place to go. I'd like to go over and visit their house, but... but um, you know, the, he, my Michael and his brother had to wear spit curls to school. <laughs> what kind of God joke is that? You know, and uh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I just didn't get it. I guess they were happy to do it. But uh, I go over to visit Mrs. Rothberg. Doug, welcome to our home. It's an honor to have you. Would you like to join us in some wine and holla? <laughs> go. Some what? Would you like to join us in some wine and holla. I go, well, I'll have some wine. I, um, I'm not much of a pastry eater, you know. Um, and then there were Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims, oh my. And so uh, I just said, uh, I, at some point in my life, I just said, okay, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I looked at religions and I found them interesting and everything. And finally, at one point, I just said, okay, I'm going to put all the religions of the world on that side of the line, and I'll stay over here and make fun of them. And that was, that was my whole program when I got to AA. So, but here was AA, the big book, saying, um, we found that God doesn't make too hard terms on those who seek him. And it goes on to say, you don't have to accept anybody's concept of God. That's a pretty efficient sentence. You don't have to accept 
anybody's concept of God. No pressure there. <laughs> you know? Find one that you're comfortable with. And that seems to be okay with the creator of the universe. I never heard that anyplace else. So it, I, I realized that AA was a different kind of thing, and I went back to AA. And I started going to AA regularly, five or six times a week. And, I, and the more I went, the more I fell in love with it. And the more I realized this is, I thought I wasn't going to fit here. I told people I wasn't going to fit. This is very likely the only place I ever fit in my life. And, uh, and my first eight months of AA, I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't have a home group. I didn't read the book. I didn't take the steps. I didn't know what a tradition was. I didn't believe in God. I didn't have a commitment, and I was drinking every day. But aside from that, I had a pretty good program, which, <laughs> which is um, keep coming back. That was my whole deal. That's all I did right. I started, uh, I got tired of raising my hand as a newcomer, so one day I didn't raise my hand. Somebody thought I had 30 days. And I didn't want to make her look bad, so I got up and took a 30-day chip. And thought, God, it made everybody so happy. I'm going to go take a chip over at the North Hollywood group, you know. <laughs> I did. Everybody was like, hey, and I'd be taking chips all over, and then someday somebody would smell whiskey on me and tell me about it, so I had to start over, but only at that one group, you know, and then I was at this club called the Valley Club one time for a noon meeting, and I heard this girl talking to her friend and saying, uh, my sponsor says I can't have sex till I'm sober six months. <laughs> so I took a six-month chip over there. Um, <laughs> it seemed like a handy thing to have, you know. <clears throat> They're all bogus Anyway, uh, you know, and who knows, I might get lucky. Huh? <laughs> I couldn't get lucky. <laughs> I guarantee you, if I could have got lucky, I would have got lucky. I couldn't have got lucky in a women's prison with a pocket full of pardons, but, uh, <laughs> but I wanted that blue chip just in case, you know. And uh, um, So I, one day I came home from a meeting, and... Uh, what I, did, I usually did, I'd go to an evening meeting and I'd get a bottle of whiskey on the way home and I'd come home and turn on the TV and lay on the floor and drink whiskey till I passed out. That's what I usually did. And one night I woke up about 3 a.m. It was common. Uh, the bottle's half full, TV's on. To reach over, turn off the TV, get my bottle, crawl on my hands and knees across the living room through the hallway, crawl into my house, you know, to go to bed. Some people, you know, seeing that would say, Oh, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. When you're doing it, I just called it going to bed, you know. Uh, it, it seemed kind of smart. There was some point in my life I said, hey, you can't fall off the floor, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, uh, so I, but this night I crawled into my bedroom and I stood up to get undressed and I fell. I just lost my balance and fell on my knees next to the bed and I spilled this whiskey all over the bed. And, Picked up the bottle. There was some left, but I, I set it in a safe place. It was a lot in the bedspread. So I set the bottle in a safe place, and I grabbed the bedspread, and I started sucking whiskey out of it like, with a passion. <laughs> and uh, a voice in my head said, hey, man, that ain't right. <laughs> you, uh, you thirsty man, there's whiskey in the bottle. But I, I'm not, no, I'm not thirsty, I'm frugal. You know, uh, <laughs> I'll waste my life, but I ain't wasting a drop of good Irish whiskey. I'm sorry, you know. Um, but I looked at what I was doing, I thought, Phew, I've been going to AA for eight months and I haven't learned how to not suck whiskey out of a bedspread. <laughs> Something's wrong. Something's wrong with this. Um, maybe I'm some hopeless loser. I know that there are such things. I hear people talk about hopeless losers that can't get this thing. I hear people get up and take cakes and things all the time and say, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It's not true. There are hopeless losers. There are people, the big book says that there are people who are unconstitu constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And, uh, and even some of them can get so if they have the, if they have the capacity to be honest. But, but there are people who can't get this thing. And I, at that moment, I thought maybe I am, which is a horrible, horrible thing to think about yourself. And because uh, by this time, I've been going to AA for eight months, and I, and I, I kind of expected that someday I would get sober. I didn't know what to do. I was out of ideas. If you're new here tonight, I don't care if you've been in and out of this thing a number of times, if you're brand new here, but if you're out of ideas, it feels hopeless, but it's a great place to be. 
out of ideas is the best thing you can be when you knew, when you knew in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was out of ideas and I did a dumb thing. I said, God, if you're there, please help me. That's the end of it. I don't even know if I knew it was a prayer when I said it. Probably did, but I just, I didn't think anybody was listening. And I went to bed and I went to sleep. And over the next couple of weeks, weird things happened every single day. I'd go into Vaughn's Market in the liquor department, somebody from AA's, you know, <laughs> pushing a cart towards me. Uh, hey, one day at a time. And, and uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in a restaurant in Burbank. I start to order a margarita. The waitress is somebody I know from AA. I go in my favorite neighborhood liquor store. And, and, and there's a guy from AA behind the counter of my store. Never been there before. Hey, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And, uh, <laughs> and this was happening every day. And after a couple of weeks of it, I'm on the way to work one morning, and I, I just killed a half pint of Bushmills, and I don't keep empty bottles in the car. They're illegal and, uh, and useless. And uh, so I, uh, I rolled down the window, and let this bottle go out the window, you know. And just as I did, there's a guy from AA driving towards me. It's 6.30 a.m. And he sees me, and he waves just as I let go of this bottle. And ding, 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 you know. And I saw him, whoa, and uh, I thought, where the hell are these people coming from? <laughs> you know, it's like those stupid miracles they talk about in the meetings. And I pulled the car over to the side of the road for a minute, and I I remember that I had been on my knees and said, God, if you're there, please help me. And it was the day after that that all these weird little things started happening. Every time I reach for a drink, there's somebody from AA in the way. Little pain in the ass God jokes, you know, that I've come to recognize as maybe miracles. I don't know, interesting coincidences. I couldn't say they weren't miracles. Maybe if there was a miracle involved, the only miracle was that I, I finally recognized it, that I asked for help and I was getting help. I don't know. But I sat there in the car that morning and I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And I decided to give it a chance. <laughs> give it a chance. And I, that was the beginning of my sobriety. And it was the beginning of my hearing the music of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, which I can't explain. There's a rhythm and a harmony and a melody that runs through this thing. I told you I have a musical background. and. Uh, and, and there's, a, there's a music that runs through and makes all the words make sense. The words used to make me crazy. People talk about give it away to keep it and surrender to win. And, and um, you know, a, a good example is when I, 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 when I was, I had 30 days of sobriety. I went to take my first honest 30-day chip. It was at the Burbank Group on a Thursday night. And uh, Thursday's cake and chip night over there. And, and uh, I went there to get my, I had enough chips to open a casino, but... <laughs> <clears throat> but I hadn't earned any of them. And now I got 30 absolute clean, sober days, and I went over to Burbank, and they said, anybody for 30 days? And I got up, and I took my chip, and I said, I'm Doug, I'm an alcoholic. And they said, hi, Doug. And I felt like a member. I felt like a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I understand the traditions today, and I know that I was a member before that. I was a member even before I, I stopped drinking, if I said I was. But I felt like a member, and there's a world of difference. It's a difference between lightning and lightning bugs. And, uh, and I sat down and watched people take 60-day and 90-day chips and six-month and nine-month chips and a seven-year cake and a 19-year cake, and I, just, and I was excited about everybody else's progress in this thing. That's not like me. It's not like me to be excited about somebody's progress who's ahead of me. <laughs> I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but I, that's where I was that night. And I was, just, I, w I was just high on the experience of being sober. And at the coffee break, I went to get my coffee, and a guy stopped me and said, uh, hey, congratulations on 30 days. And I said, thanks. And he said, you know what the secret is? I said, nah, don't drink, I guess. And he said, no, nah, that's not it. We, we don't drink here. But the deal is here to hang on. You know, hang on. Can you do that? And I said, well, that's what I've been doing. He said, exactly, precisely, man. Keep doing that. You'll be all right. And I'm thinking, okay, you get 30 days, they tell you what the secret is. And I'm, so I'm now looking for a newcomers I can screw up, I mean, to share my experience, strength, and hope with. <laughs> and uh, before I could find a victim, uh, <laughs> there's a guy at Burbank named Jim B., Jim Baker. He died about six months ago, and uh, he's 
dearly missed over there, but he, he's one of these southern-born, back-slapping, glad-handing alcoholics. You know, you got him everywhere. And he came up to me and he said, son, congratulations on that 30 days. I said, thanks. And he said, you know what the secret is? I said, yes, sir, hang on. He said, no, let go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, I get it, I get it. I'm hearing the music. The words aren't making me crazy anymore. The guy that said, hang on, is talking about, stay close, keep coming back, stay in the middle of the herd, they used to say. And Jim had told me, let go, is talking about let go and let God. <laughs> Surrender, the war is over, you lost. You start hearing the music and the words start making sense. Uh, and I found out that people in AA misquote the big book. Happens all the time, happens every day. But I thought that anybody with over 90 days probably had you know, the book memorized by now. <laughs> but I wasn't reading it, and so I figured if I got a memory, I got a good memory. So people always quote the book in meetings. Sometimes they even give page numbers. So I figured if I just listen and memorize, I'll have all the important parts, not the crap, but just the important parts, memorized sometimes with page numbers. So I can, people will think I read it. So, uh, but, but I didn't know that people misquoted all the time. And they, and they hardly ever say, I'm not sure if that's right. Maybe you ought to read it. Let me tell you, maybe you ought to read it. Uh, <laughs> then you can know what it says and what it doesn't say. Duh. But uh, I heard a lady say, our book says that our drinking was but a symptom of deeper underlying causes and conditions, which it does say. But then she went on to add her own stuff. She said, if you don't find your deeper underlying cause and condition, you will drink again. What? As I, <laughs> the book doesn't say that, but I didn't know because I'm not reading it. I thought that was right out of the gospel, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> deeper underlying cause and condition. I don't know what my deeper underlying, I didn't come from an alcoholic family. My dad was the kind of guy who could, you know, buy a six pack, drink one and put five in the fridge and forget they're there. It makes me sick. At, uh, my mother, my mother might be an alcoholic. We don't know, because she won't drink. And uh, <laughs> uh, you can't tell. You know, how would you tell? Uh, character defect, you know, they all got them. You know, it's like, I asked her one time, how, why don't you drink? And she said, what do you care? I said, well, uh, because I just wondered if you're an alcoholic. You know, there's such a thing as a genetic predisposition. It might be your fault I'm a drunk. <laughs> and she said, uh, well, I don't know. When I was young, she said, when I was young, I drank. Uh, and uh, every time I drank, I got sick, stupid, and obnoxious, so I just quit. <laughs> I, said, I said, you got to drink through that, Mom. You know, <clears throat> I'm preaching to the choir now. I mean, the, the, the promised land is beyond the stick, stupid, and obnoxious. But uh, she doesn't get that. She doesn't have the tenacity to make this program, you know. She thinks we like falling down, <laughs> but, but uh, so I don't know. I, and I, you know, I, did, I was looking for my deeper underlying cause, and I couldn't. I, I thought, I don't know. Oh, oh, oh. When I was 24 years old, I moved from Orange County, California, up to Hollywood to try to make a, make a foothold in the music business, try to start making a living in the music business. And I, I would meet people and I would, uh, you know, network as they say now, and I might end up playing guitar on somebody's album or, you know, co-writing a song or singing background or playing harmonica, getting a kind of a foothold in, in these people. And then I was living up in Hollywood and a show came to town called Hair, opened at the Aquarius Theater. And it was a Broadway show about hippies. And I was a hippie. so. I wanted to see what it was about, and I went to see it, and it was beautiful. I mean, I, and I like Broadway shows anyway, but this was like a Broadway show about me, you know? It's like naked pe people got naked, and they screamed rock and roll, and they, uh, you know, smoked dope on stage, and I'm like, oh, this is great, man. And, <coughs> excuse me, one character named Burgess wung on a rope and screamed rock and roll and stripped down to a loincloth, went out and harassed the people in the audience and spare changed people and <clears throat> sex crazed speed freak leader of the tribe. I said, I could do that. So I called the Aquarius Theater the next day. I said, hey, I'd like to be in your show. And like, you couldn't do this today. This is not, the world's different today than it was in 1969. But I called the Aquarius Theater and I said, I want to be in your show. And they said, 
can you sing? And I said, yeah, I sing my ass off. He said, what's your name? I told him. He said, what are you doing Friday at 1 o'clock? You tell me. <laughs> he said, uh, get some sheet music and come on down. You got an audition, 1 o'clock at the Aquarius Theater. Cool. So, like, uh, Friday morning, I'm, I, I, I want to really, I, I know this is a dancing show. I thought, these people are Broadway chorus gypsy dancers, you know. And I don't know, I'm the guy up on the bandstand playing guitar or bass or something and watching people dance. I know what good dancing looks like, but I never tried to do it. And, uh, and so I, I'm, but I think maybe if I sing good enough, they won't care if I can't dance. So practicing this song and, and, I, and I broke a string on my guitar. And I, hippies were like, oh, bad karma, dude. You know, so. I went into my roommate's room to see if he had the string I needed, and it was right on his dresser in its little D-string envelope. Good karma, dude. So I picked up the envelope, and underneath the envelope was a little white capsule, which I didn't know what it was. I wonder what this is. Oh, because um, we didn't have a PDR. You pretty much had to swallow test everything, you know. It's, it's a good test. Forget about heavy machinery and, out, and motor vehicles, you know. The, Whatever it does, that's what it does. And if it, somebody dies, don't eat the green shit. It's really easy. And, and uh, this turned out to be THC. I love this reaction in AA meeting. You say THC, to woo, woo, woo. The only other place I know you can get this reaction is go to a PTA meeting and hold up a kitten. Did anybody lose a kitten? Oh, you know, well, we, got, we, got, we get soft over THC. Oh. If you don't know, it's a synthetic marijuana, and it's a nice little psychedelic. So 45 minutes later, when I got down to the Aquarius Theater, I floated up the steps of that theater, and my hair was long over my shoulders, and it just swished when I walked, and had these hip-hugger bell-bottoms on, bells about that big, and no shirt on. Just I'm 50 pounds younger, too, by the way, and uh, uh, just a vest with six layers of foot-long red, white, and blue leather fringe. And I was a walking wind chime, walking up there and it's like with my sheet music in my hand. And I'm standing back at the theater, watching these people audition. And I said, man, those hippies dance, you know? <laughs> they can dance. And then, oh, listen to that gal sing. Oh, man, they're good. And I almost forgot what I was there for. And somebody said, Doug Rowell. Is Doug Rowell here? Said, yeah, yeah. So I went down. I went up on stage. And I handed the sheet music to the piano player. And he opens it. Big grin, he looks up and he starts to play. Bump, 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 bump. I said, wow, I feel good. And I went into this James Brown number and I thought I was the godfather of soul. And uh, <laughs> I'm down on one knee and back up again. And when I hold you in my arms and <laughs> they're nudging each other, you know. And I get done and they said, cool, man. We love it. Uh, we love your energy. Can you do something a little mellower for us so we kind of get a range? Yeah, I wasn't ready for that, but I just went into this a cappella version of Otis Redding's Dock of the Bay. I made myself cry. <laughs> <laughs> Piano player picked it up, and we were right in the pocket, you know, and, uh, and I see him nudging each other. This kid sings, and uh, I got done, and they said, cool, man, great, love you. We just got to see you dance. Play. So the guy started to play, and I start, you know, <laughs> and I see my hair coming around. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. You know what trails are? And, uh, <laughs> and the fringe on this vest is. <laughs> and I heard somebody say, Jesus, can he dance? Because, <laughs> you know, alcohol and drugs did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, and they. They hired me on the spot, but not for the L.A. show. They fi hired me to come here to Las Vegas, to the International Hotel. And uh, uh, I came here, and, and I started uh, playing in the tribe, and then I started understudying the character of Berger, and then we, we left Vegas, and we went on the road, and, I, and they gave me the pink contract. The, they, I was playing the obnoxious, speed freak, sex crazed leader of the tribe. <laughs> it was a stretch, but I could do it. And, and uh, <laughs> We'd play some, and we toured with, all over the United States and Canada for three years. What a great job. People would come up to us afterwards and go, hey, man, here's some pot, brother. Send some me in Maui Waui, Panama Red, Acapulco Gold. Give us all this great dope for nothing, you know, because we could sing and dance. And uh, some of you like acid here. Osley, Purple Haze, Orange Sunshine, Window Pain. Hey, 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 hey. And then uh, <laughs> got a witness, and uh, <clears throat> some girl would come up and go, Oh, God, I love you. 
take me. <laughs> go, okay. <laughs> you know? So sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and traveling around the country and getting paid for it. It was not a bad job. But I looked back at it from my newfound sobriety, and I thought, yeah, they used me. You know, uh, you don't realize what a victim you are, you know, when you're living it. It's looking back on it. And I called my sponsor. I said, hey, I found it. He said, what did you find now, Doug? I was always finding stuff. I said, my deeper underlying cause and condition. He said, oh, oh, yeah, well, let's hear that. I said, hair. Hair? Your hair? What if we cut your hair? You think you can not drink then? No, not my hair. Remember I told you when I was like 24 and I was a big star, I traveled around the country. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the big star deal. Yeah, yeah. But um, I thought you were loaded when you auditioned for that show. And I, uh, I told him too much. And uh, I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you something, Doug. Most people, non-alcoholic people, when they go to interview for a job they really want, won't take a drug they can't identify. <laughs> That's clear. I get it. So I said, I don't know. Then I don't know what my deeper underlying cause could be. Maybe I'll get drunk. He said, you will. You will get drunk if you swallow alcohol. So here's the deal. Don't swallow any alcohol. And uh, call me tomorrow. Go to, go to a meeting tomorrow. And read that book tomorrow. Read the whole book. Just read. Start. I want you to start reading the book tomorrow. Read it every day. If you can't read a page, read a par if you can't read a paragraph, I mean a, a a chapter, read a page. If you can't read a page, read a paragraph. So you got the rest of your life to recover, but you got to stay in the middle of it. Simple stuff. Best advice I ever got. If you can't read a chapter, read a page. If you can't read a page, read a paragraph. I still do it, and uh, my life keeps getting better. You know, I never did find my deeper underlying cause and condition. Not really. I finally settled on trauma from circumcision. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember it, but if it happened today, it would make me a little restless, irritable, and discontented. <laughs> but I'm stuck in the middle of the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm living around the music. I'm dancing this thing all over the country. <laughs> I, get to, I get to get up in the morning, go to my 7 a.m. meeting, get on a plane, come to Las Vegas, spend all day with my friend Bob, come out here and play with you guys and go home. You know, uh, I wouldn't have chosen this. I tried not to. And God wouldn't leave me alone. Thanks for letting me share with you. Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing. <laughs>